No word resonates with America like the word freedom, right? I mean, every commercial you watch, it's about freedom. You know, freedom this and freedom that. There's all, freedom is the word surrounding America, right? That's the word. Like, if you, 4th of July, do you go 4th of July without saying the word freedom? I mean, freedom is a really big word. Politicians use it all the time. In fact, when they want to get an applause, if you've been watching any of the debates, man, you say the word freedom, you're going to get something. Like, somebody's going to clap for you. You just say, Americans deserve freedom. You, they, they say, so what's your policy on, uh, you know, on uh, you know, the poor receiving you know, money from the government? Ah, w- what we need is freedom in America. What we need is freedom. Did I say that loud enough? And they get an applause. Politicians, advertisers, salesmen, we all know. Military leaders, recruiters, what we sell in America here is we sell freedom. And we all know that how this word attracts attention and it draws interest. And if you think, man, the government's silly, you care about freedom too. You care about freedom too. Because we're Americans, most of us, and we, or at least we live in America, and we've come to learn the zeitgeist of our country and our culture. And our culture here is all about being independent of Great Britain. That was the, the foundation of the United States. I mean, we celebrate every year Independence Day. That's literally a word, or a day about freedom. We celebrate this constantly, right? Well, marketers have caught on to this, and they want to kind of exploit this. Maybe you've you've seen this. And uh, I, I, I think it's interesting how marketers have gotten really clever and they've, they've decided that they would play on the emotions of, of us as they sold stuff. I mean, I don't know if you've heard of, you heard of a company called Deliveroo. No, it's not working. But they've got a culture. They, they're currently running a campaign ad. It's kind of like Postmates or Grubhub or something like that. They're running a campaign called Food Freedom. Food Freedom. It's all about food freedom. And they, they, they show in their, in their commercial because people still watch those. They show in their commercial people trying to access food, but there's like red lasers around them, like uh, some sort of like Ocean's Eleven movie, and they can't get through to the food they want because they're in food slavery. And they're stuck making the same meals at home every day. And they show like the people begrudgingly making chicken and rice. Oh man, this is terrible. When I could be having McDonald's, I'm, I want food freedom, so you should get Deliveroo. And then there's the Chase Freedom card, which half of you have in your wallet. And uh, the Chase Freedom card sells you freedom. And what's the freedom? The freedom is you get to choose what you spend your credit card points on, right? And so you're free to put money in your credit card and pay 18% interest and choose point. Uh, you get a dollar per thousand, like what is it, a point per thousand dollars? I don't know what it is, but it sounds like bondage, not freedom. And... It's not, it's not freedom. They're just telling you. It just says freedom on the card. You're not actually free. You, you still are forced to pay your bill. You're not free for anything. You're actually not getting any sort of freedom from that card. I'm sorry to tell you, you're in bondage. Next, Harley Davidson's All for Freedom and Freedom for All campaign. Now, if you're from you know, Louisiana or something like that, or you're from Texas, man, you love this campaign, or you're from the Midwest, because it's all for freedom and freedom for all. The video shows race footage, a bunch of pictures of old dudes riding Harleys, being free on the open road, free out there, riding around, people of all walks of life coming together for the love of freedom via Harley Davidson, and that's what they're selling you. And also, just for a good measure, there's a random bald eagle just flies over the top of the commercial, (laughs) because what's freedom without a bald eagle? You know what I'm saying? So we're just selling freedom. And then there's Ford's freedom event, which I guess you're not really free from paying, you know, your mortgage, your lease payment or your, your car payment. You're free to buy a car and pay it. I don't know where they just added the word free in there. That's what they did. They just added it in. Like people like freedom. Let's add it in Ford freedom event. What does it mean? Nothing. Come buy a car. That's all it means. And oftentimes the ads get really convoluted and they get really obnoxious. And actually we don't even really know why they're mentioning the word freedom. They're just like throwing it in there with a really confusing ad. And so me being me, I had to find a really confusing ad about freedom and show it to you guys. So can we, can you play that? Freedom. Now there's a thought. My granddad Joe used to say, there's two four o'clocks in a day, you know, son. And you ain't nobody's backup dancer. In this life, who gives a knife and fork about cutlery? Freedom, you gotta wear it like a slogan t-shirt. You work it, Irene. This is pure, unadulterated, don't tell me what to do, freedom. And here, they serve it by the slice. So grab your taste buddies, 
and let's hustle. New menu, new look, new vibe. Pizza Hut. Taste freedom. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, so what did you learn about freedom? You learned literally nothing about freedom. There was a dude crump dancing and throwing baby powder. Um, there was a lady bathing in a milkshake. Uh, you learned nothing about freedom in that commercial, but that you can taste it through Pizza Hut. And we're going to be giving out Pizza Hut coupons after this. So no, I'm just kidding. Don't go there. Um, few words are so commonplace in, like today and have so much meaning, but also are just convoluted and mean really nothing, right? Does that make sense? You, you get that? Is that a good personification of what we're talking about here? You know, why do people want freedom so much? And quite honestly, why do we fight for it in this country? I mean, our country is literally founded off a war that produced independence, produced freedom. But why have people throughout history have been willing to fight or even die for freedom today? Why? Why has that happened here today? Well, one answer is really obvious, right? Oppression, it comes, and people don't like oppression, and we're all suffering through it, and we're high, hardwired to flee suffering. So the way we get out of it is by fighting for our freedom. We don't want to suffer. True. But recent research really indicates an, an additional cause to our desire for this. We actually all human beings seem to be wired for something called autonomy. See, actually, uh, psycho Psychology Today, their magazine, they would define autonomy as this, the ability to make choices according to one's own free will. When we, when we feel like we're, people are taking away our freedom, that's actually taking away our autonomy to do whatever it is we want to do as an individual. So we're actually wired to avoid that. So um, uh, Dr. Alex Lickerman, he, he's a medical doctor, he did some research and found that actually the, the unhappiest part of a doctor's day is dealing with insurance companies because they're the time it takes. And it's the one part of the day doctors feel like it's not actually theirs, they're not autonomous in that time. They, they are, their freedom is removed, their autonomy is removed, and that's why we're upset. It turns out that restrictions on our autonomy, our ability to do whatever it is we want, may lie at the heart of the greatest deal of our unhappiness today in our culture. So the reason why we like freedom is because less freedom makes us unhappy, less autonomy makes us unhappy, so we think. So when a person opens up a Bible and reads this, and maybe for the first time you read it and go, man, this is just a big book of rules. This is just a cage on my spirit, and they bristle at it. No way am I reading this thing. I mean, this is just too much. I'm free. I like to live, live my life the way I want to live it. No, thank you. Well, and many people will obviously say the Bible wants to take away that personal freedom that I have, and I make my choices, and I'm an American, or I'm an intellectual, or I'm a Californian, or whatever we say, but whatever we are, whatever we define ourselves as, the Bible takes away that which makes me autonomous to do and make my own decisions. I don't like it. But it kind of does beg the question, though, because a lot of people do worship Jesus. And a lot of people do, many of us in here. If the Bible just robs us of our given rights and freedoms, like why would anyone want to follow it? If it just makes us slaves to something or it cages us up, why does anybody even want to be a Christian, right? Like, that doesn't make any sense. You know, despite our American commitment to overt and autonomous freedom, it's actually the Christian position that lordship underneath Jesus is actually a better life and makes us more free than the, the life without Jesus. So the premise of today's sermon is this, a life lived under God's law leads to more freedom than a life without his law. So it may, it may seem a little bit contradiction, contradicting, but a life lived, do you have that? Can you, is that, I want everyone to see that. Yes. A life lived under God's law leads to more freedom than a life without his law, okay? So that's maybe counterintuitive, but I hope to explain it to you. In our passage today from Jesus himself, he's going to demonstrate really how we misunderstand what freedom actually is in our own world and how God is actually the one that's able to provide the most freedom despite you might thinking, maybe us thinking that this is kind of like a rule book for us and we can't get out of it, okay? So here's my first thing for you. You're not as free as you think. You're not as free as you think. We are not as free as we think. In America, we're free. We think freedom is the ideal setting. In fact, there's a movement going around called the FIRE movement, not like the festivals, okay, but the FIRE, uh, financial independence, retire early. And what this means is that the goal is to get out of the workplace because the workplace is a cage. It limits our freedom. And so our job is to get out of the workplace as soon as possible because that's a cage on our lives. We need to not work. We need to get out of, we need to explore our own 
freedom. But unfortunately, we are not as free as we think we are in any capacity. You're not physically free to do actually whatever it is you want. You're actually not. Who here is free to jump 12 feet in the air? Like Super Mario, brother. Wouldn't that be great? Can you jump 12 feet in the air? You're not free to do that. We're actually not free to sing like Mariah Carey or, well, some of us might be. Wouldn't that be cool? Or maybe breathe underwater? There's actually like physical limitations on our, us as human beings that actually enable us to not be free to do whatever it is we want. We actually can't. We are bound by certain physical laws. Anyone here not die besides Jesus? We're bound by the laws of nature. We actually have to, we have to actually adhere to these laws. We're bound by certain physical laws, and actually we're not free to stop sinning. Sinning is, uh, is a Christian word that talks, it, it, it is about missing the mark. It's about God laying a standard and us not actually being able to uphold it. We actually cannot, under any circumstances, uphold the law of God perfectly. It is impossible for us to do that we aren't free to make certain we'll call it metaphysical choices spiritual choices you know with physical physical metaphysical woo woo spiritual right there's spiritual emotional things that are actually keeping us from being able to do exactly what it is we want to do somebody say well i don't know if that's true right well prove us all wrong never sin again like i i, I could just prove it right now read the bible and just do all of it you can't right you're actually bound by certain metaphysical laws. You actually cannot do it. And this is kind of brings us to our first point in our, in our text here, John chapter 8, verse 31. Look what Jesus says here. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, now these are the people that believed him, listen, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Now, Jesus' listeners are a little bit hard-headed, okay? Much like many of us, including or me. Like, we, we hear Jesus talk, and we kind of hear something else. Actually, Jesus, you hear the, the, the understanders of Jesus, what the people that are there listening to him are, are hearing him talk physically. Physically, physically, like, we're not, we're not enslaved to anyone. Now, the Israelites had been enslaved a few type, different times. They were enslaved to Egypt. They were enslaved to Babylon. They, they thought that we're not, we're not currently under any sort of slavery. What are you talking about? And furthermore, I'm actually a child of Abraham. Just so you know, those who were born into the line of Abraham believed in Jesus' day that they would inherit uh, a, a Messiah that would reconcile the world to them. So God was in perfect relationship with them. And they believed there's actually, there's actually no way I'm enslaved to anybody. I'm a child of Abraham. That's what they're saying right here. Furthermore, we're people of, we're people of Israel. There's no way we can be separated from God. But here's what they miss, and I suspect many of us actually in here miss, that we're not just bound by physical laws. We're bound by spiritual laws as well. Jesus is here talking spiritually to them. If you know the truth, the truth will set you free. You don't even see it in your own heart. There are things you're doing that you don't want to be doing that you're doing anyway, and you need to be free of those things, and you're still doing them. Jesus is upping the ante. Many of us come to come in here too. I, I, I've done this myself. We come in and we think Christianity is all about doing stuff. No, it's about being someone. Christianity makes you something. It changes you. It takes your heart out and gives you a new identity. And out of that identity, you begin to serve Jesus. That's how it works. It's actually backwards. These guys felt the same way. They thought, oh no, physically I'm not bound by slavery. Well, Jesus is saying, actually, no, there are sins you don't understand that are causing problems in your heart. And this is where we get this dichotomy where actually Jesus says we can be a slave to sin. Man, that's a harsh word. Or you can be a child of God. There's these two things. Look at verse 34. Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you. By the way, in this language, when they would repeat something, over and over again, that was like emphasizing something. Uh, there were exclamation points in this language. And so if Jesus is repeating himself, he's actually putting like an exclamation point on the sentence, okay? And so here he's saying, truly, truly, exclamation point, I say to you, anyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. What is he saying? You thought you were free, but don't you sin? Oh, I guess you do. Who practices sin? Do you guys know? The Israelites? Just them? All of us, we all practice sin. So what does that mean? Everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. That includes the listeners of Jesus right there, and it includes us. 
We're not even free to stop doing the things we don't want to do. How free are we? Well, physically, we're not even free to, to stop, like to stay on a diet. <laughs> we're not, we're not even, sometimes not even free to get to class on time. We're, we're not even free to not be harsh with our children. We're not free to do any of these things. And yet, sometimes we think, man, this is the number one key thing in my life is this freedom, 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 freedom. We're not even free to stop doing the things we don't want to do. And from the very moment at birth as human beings, we are born into something called sin. And that kind of leads me to say that sin is a condition, not a behavior. Sin is a condition, not a behavior. That means, do you have that up there? Sin is a condition, not a behavior, which means that if, if you're born into something and you have a condition, you're bound by the condition. You're bound by the condition. You can't, if, if sin was just, if, if behavior was just, or sorry, if sin was just uh, a behavior, well, you could just stop doing it, Right? You could just stop doing it. Now, maybe some people kind of go off on the wrong side of the ship on that, and they'll say, man, if I meditate more, if I study more, then I could probably stop doing what the Bible calls sin. Like, if I just saw it, and, and I just knew what it was. This is my story. Like, a guy who gave me the Bible, he said, why do you do things that you say you're, say you're not about? Like, I, I see, I look at your behavior, and I hear what you say about your life, and I'm looking at these two things, and they're not congruent. And I said, well, who are you to judge me? You know, what do you mean? And you know, that's my voice at 18 years old. And, uh, and then he's like, all right, well, here's the Bible. This has, like, this is like a really good diagnostic tool to tell you where you, uh, where you falter. And I was like, tell me where I falter? I don't think so. Give me that book and 72 hours and I will have it nailed. And I believed that in my heart of hearts. I really did. And I got, I don't know, 23 hours in, 24 hours in before I was like, you know what? There's something to this. I don't think I can actually do what the Bible says just by reading it. I don't actually think I can. And that's true for all of us. The Bible isn't a roadmap to your life to show you how to be better as a human being, although it does do that. It's a diagnostic tool to show you where you need Jesus the most. Where's Jesus going to cover your brokenness? That's what I didn't know. Now, some will say, man, the Bible standard for sin is too high. That's why none of us can do it, because we're all human. We all we all make mistakes, and so the Bible is setting an impossibly high standard, or maybe even churches are taking what God says and twisting it and putting up a high standard so no one could ever reach it, but that was never fair. It should have never done that. But by your own standard, you can't even stop doing what you don't want to do, let alone the Bible standard. You can't even do that. You can't even get up when your alarm goes off. You can't even make dinner when you want to make dinner. You can't even not get short with your friends in your relationships or, or, or getting tiffs in your marriage. It's, you can't even do that. You can't even not get into that conflict. Have you ever apologized? You've gone against your own law. We're not even free to do that, let alone the Bible's laws. Listen, if you feel this way, you're not alone. First of all, we all do this, okay? All of us. That includes me. That's everyone in this room. No one is getting this down. But take even greater comfort to know that a guy who wrote most of the New Testament also couldn't do this. Right? If you wrote the Bible, it's pretty good, right? Like LeBron James, pretty good basketball player. Like Barack Obama, like president, I wrote the Bible. Pretty good, right? I mean, I feel like that's like up there in terms of like accomplishments. He wrote the Bible. He felt the same way, and he wrote large parts of the Bible. He felt like he couldn't even get it under wraps. Look at Romans 7, verse 15. This is Paul talking. He says, for I do not understand my own actions. <laughs> Does anyone ever feel that? I just don't, I don't even get myself. I literally said I wouldn't do that. I woke up the next day. I did the exact same thing. I said I wouldn't. I've been saying this for weeks. Weeks I've been saying I was going to start a diet. Weeks I've been saying I was going to get a job. Weeks I said I was going to stop messing with this guy or this girl. I've been saying that for years. I, I, I don't understand myself. This guy wrote the Bible. I don't understand my own actions. And he says, I do not understand my own actions. Next time you wake up and you did something you don't want to do, just say that. For I do not understand my own actions. <laughs> Like, just get up and say that to yourself in the mirror. Make you feel better. And then here, look, look what he says. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. <laughs> Verse 16. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law. That is good, he says. For now, it is no longer I who do it, but sin who dwells in me. He's saying the sin is what's doing all this in me. I don't want to do it, but it's doing it. Verse 18, for I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Man, I, 
I don't know about you, but I've been trying and grinding away. I've been listening to all these words and grind and hustle and grit and all these cool things. And there's lots of videos and people are going viral talking about all this stuff. And yet I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. He's getting to something. He's getting to something. He has a desire to do something, but not the ability to carry it out. Verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. He's trying to be very clear. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin who dwells in me. The Apostle Paul, man who wrote majority of the New, uh, New Testament, many different epistles, he believed he was limited by his sin nature. Now, many new podcasters and vodcasters and YouTube teachers and even preachers are going to tell you somehow you can get beyond the Apostle Paul. Not true. You are bound by your sin, bound by it. And so you are not free. Anyone, Jesus says, who sins is what? A slave to sin. Just because some cool guy tells us that we're not all of a sudden does not make it true. I'm going with Jesus, not the hipster guy, okay? I'm going with Jesus. He's the one I'm going to listen to. And furthermore, just to point to, humanity, though, humanity actually needs laws in order to flourish. So not only are we limited by the, we're not as free as we think, but actually, we actually need laws. We actually need those things. So it's not just like we can just exist without them. We actually require them to bring order to the chaos of our own hearts and our own lives. God institutes his own law to help us govern and manage our sins so that we are aware of its own consequences in our lives. You ever read something in the Bible and you're like, man, that makes a lot of sense. And then you do the exact opposite and go, yeah, I guess I should have listened to that. You ever do that? Yeah, yeah, that's called sin. <laughs> Welcome to the club. You join us. We're all hypocrites. We're all sinners. Okay, we act, we, we sin. That's how it happens. Now, I want to make the case, though, that these specific set of laws actually enable us to behave how we're created. God's law actually helps us flourish in more freedom than we even think. Now, before we get up all in arms about God's rules and the Old Testament and what God meant with all the Old Testament and all this stuff, just consider this. Laws in society are good, right? Does anyone here like the law that we have in our country? Maybe not all of it. Are you happy that murder is illegal? Yeah, I'm happy murder is illegal. Are you happy that there's stop signs and stop lights? Yeah, it helps, right? Right, we, can, we get to govern. Are you thankful that stealing is illegal? That there's a law against stealing? Yeah, we don't, we don't like, we, we, we like to think we're free, but we actually really enjoy the laws we have here in America, isn't it? Like, that's why court TV and actually, um, weirdly enough, one of the most popular things on YouTube today is when a, a criminal or a, a person on trial is being read whether or not they're guilty or not guilty, or guilty or un, not guilty. One of the most popular things to watch. You can go turn on the, and just type in guilty verdict. Twenties millions of hits, tens of millions of hits on people being read their rights and seeing their reactions. We're people that love law. We think we don't like it, but we're actually very thankful for the law. And there's a really popular movie, and it's actually a scary movie. It's called The Purge. Has anyone seen The Purge? <laughs> Nobody? Good. You're all good Christians. You haven't seen The Purge. Me neither. But what I hear about The Purge is that <laughs> it's a scary movie. Why? Because, and what's the premise? They take away the laws. No laws. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> like, we're afraid of a world without law. <laughs> That's the premise. That's it. And what are we afraid of? We're afraid of people's actions without laws. Why? Because we're a sinful bunch, aren't we? we? The things that we want to do, we don't do. The things that we do do, we don't want to do. It happens. Sin. We're afraid. The purge. Without laws in our society, we'd have anarchy. What about the laws of physics? Pretty good, right? We like the laws of physics. Laws of physics teach you that if you jump out of a window, you hit the ground at 9.8 newtons per meter. And if, you, if you're high enough, your inertia will carry you into the ground and you will hit an unmovable object with your very, very malleable body, okay? So now we know, don't jump out windows. Windows, bad. Don't jump out. We like, we like living. We understand that. We also know that if we stay underwater for too long, we, we die. We know that. We, 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 we heed that law, don't we? The law is actually a good thing. Now consider a few different other examples in nature. What about a whale? Right? Many will say, man, I feel like the laws are just so oppressive in a whale. Let's say a whale feels the same way. The whale's like, you know what? I feel like the laws of nature are oppressive to who I want to be as a whale. 
You know, I'm swimming around down here. I feel like this is fine down here, but what about up there? I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to see what it's like to live outside of water for a while. And yeah, I'm a mammal, so let's, let's give it a shot. And so Mr. Whale decides he's going flip, to flop, flip out onto the sidewalk, right? And he, boom, he plops himself down, and he's like, man, that's pretty cool for a bit. Below hole, like, wait a second, what's happening to me? What happens to the whale? Mr. Whale dies, okay? Mr. Whale dies, why? Why does Mr. Whale die? And Mr. Whale violated his own nat- na- laws of nature. He belongs in the water, doesn't he? He belongs in the water, so he violates this law. But he is free if he stays in the water, isn't he? If he's free in the water, he can go wherever he wants. He can swim around. Whales often migrate from Alaska to Seattle all the way down to the Bay Area, up the up, down the Pacific coast, and then back around to Hawaii. They go in this big circle. Pretty cool. Orca whales get to do that in the water. But they can't get on a Disney cruise liner and do that. Okay? It's not good for the whale. They die. Consider, about, consider uh, an airplane. An airplane has to fly, right? It's planes, maybe the plane's like, you know, I'm free to fly. I want to I wanna get up to my uh, takeoff velocity. I want to get into the sky, and I'm going to fly around. But you know what? I feel like these wings are oppressive. I feel like I just don't have enough, you know, uh, stunt power. You know, I'm looking at the F-16s out there, and they're going. I feel like I need to shrink down a little bit and get a little bit more maneuverable, so I'm going to lose my wings. What happens to the plane? It crashes, right? Why? Because it violated the laws of aerodynamics. It needs its laws to flourish. It needs its laws to flourish. It doesn't say, you know, I'm free to fly without wings or holes in my cabin because I just want to be free for who I am and what I want to do with my life doesn't happen humans need god's law in order to flourish as human beings here's what i'm getting at just like a whale needs the laws of nature to flourish and a plane needs the laws of aerodynamics to flourish humans need god's law in order to flourish now could you be a plane without aerodynamic the laws of aerodynamics sure you could you'd be a really bad one the argument here is that human actually following god's law enables you to be as free as you possibly can within his laws and his laws by the way lead to communion with him and joy and peace in your life leads to the flourishing of humanity flourishing the law of god is good and provides the proper environment for human beings to live and flourish the law of god is akin to the proper rearing of a child anyone have a couple of you have kids in here now i'm a parent my kids eat a lot of food okay they're very very hungry kids it feels like um, as opposed to regular kids it's not good for me as a father to allow my son even though he would to eat six bowls of cocoa puffs every single morning and trust me he can eat six full adult bowls of cocoa puffs if he if he so chose but i said you know what? that's not a good thing for him i think for him it'd be better for him to flourish under my laws which is to eat a healthier breakfast not to flourish under his laws to eat ice cream for lunch or dinner and he might kick and scream and be upset and go, I thought this was America. I thought I could do whatever I want. You know, I thought like, this is ridiculous. You're going to put me in that bath? I'm not getting in that bath. You're a dictatorial, oppressive father that you want me clean. I cannot believe that. That is horrifying on your part. Why would a good God allow this to happen to me? I don't like the water in my eyes. But it's good for me as a father to say, this is actually the best way for you to live, isn't it? It's not good for me to not allow my children to do their homework. They do their homework and it makes them a better individual so that they grow up and can flourish as adults. It's not that I'm a mean, oppressive dictator. It's not that my wife's a mean, oppressive dictator. It's not that we're evil and we're like, they go kicking and screaming into all of the things that we want for them in their lives. But it's that we want them to flourish. Yeah? I want them to flourish. I was in the grocery store about a few years ago and I never thought I would ever tell this story, but... I was in the grocery store a few years ago um, at a Safeway or something like that, and I um, was standing in line, and there was a mom It just gets in line right behind me. And the reason I know she's a mom, she had a daughter, and her daughter was flipping through like a Cosmo magazine or <laughs> something like that. She was flipping through a Cosmo magazine like right next to the aisle, and she's like, sweetie, come here, sweetie. Like, come get in line. It's almost our turn. And she goes, shut up, mom. Excuse me. Excuse me for the little ones in the room. Shut up, mom. Was that nice? No. And then he was like, okay, sweet. Just, just, it's, it's fine. Just stay there until we're done. Now, I'm not here to judge anybody's parenting. I don't know what's going on in that little girl's heart. 
But what I do know is oftentimes our reactions to God are the same way. I know what's best for you. I know what we're supposed to do. Hey, listen, just don't bother me with that right now. I'm doing my own thing. And we're raised in a way that causes us to create division between us and Father instead of unity when our Father just wants good things for us. And oftentimes we don't want to do what God wants us to do. We want to do what we want to do because we're free individuals. Listen, if God is big enough to create the universe and people, he's big enough to want things out of us that we don't want to do. Okay? If, if, if I'm a big enough parent to my son and my daughters that, that, that I'm big enough, I've, I've birthed them, they're, they're, well, my wife birthed them, I was there, I was present, and they've, they've raised, I, I have more knowledge than them, then there's probably things I want them to do that they don't understand. Right. And, and, and for their own benefit, for their own benefit. And God is the same way. If, if God is, exists, and if he's real, and he did create the world, it's, there's probably a few things God wants out of you that you don't want to do. Because you're probably 20, 30, 40 years old. You've been around not that long. None of us have been around that long. This is an eternal God is asking something out of us, and he might have something for us that we don't want to do. So question, where in your faith does your God contradict you? Where in your faith does your God contradict you? Because trust me, he must contradict you. We are bound by sin, bound by the laws of physics. God is an eternal God. He does things. He does things bigger and far beyond our own understanding. If he's done all of that, if he is real, if you want to grant that, then there's something he wants out of you that you don't want to do. Now, if you're looking at your life and you're going, you know what, there is no ways God contradicts me. I feel like God and I are on the same page. Then you do not have a God you have a yes man of your own creation. You have fabricated a deity that does whatever you want him to do. He obeys all of the different laws that you obey. He tells you it's okay to not serve or give or go to church or talk to certain people or to believe certain political, sexual, cultural ethics. He doesn't contradict you in any way. That's like a Stepford wife God, a yes man. That's what you have. But if God's big enough, to create the world, he's big enough to do things in, for, in things you don't understand. He's big enough for that. So where, in your faith, does your God contradict you? By the way, real freedom is not the absence of laws. It's actually the proper laws given to us by God that allow us to flourish well. That's the point. Last thing, following God gives us more freedom, not less. I know, I know, I know. Real freedom, though, is not the absence or restraint of the laws. It's the submission to our limits as our own people. We submit to where we are lost. A God big enough to create the world knows things I don't know. I'm only 33, 42, 50 years old. It's possible I don't have all the answers. God must have them. But once we understand our limits, then we are able to truly be free because now we know how to operate in our life. You ever meet a friend? Let's just call him a friend, okay? Let's call him a friend or her a friend that literally doesn't know their own limits doesn't know how much they need to be out partying, doesn't know their limits at work, doesn't know that they're harming people around them, has no clue. They're operating outside of their own limits, they're outside of their own boundaries. That's what we're talking about here. God's saying, if you stay within my boundaries, you're actually gonna flourish as a human being. Stay within yourself. Look at verse 34 again. Jesus says, Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin, Verse 35, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. What does he mean? Jesus is, to help us understand this, is giving us another comparison. He's comparing slaves to a son. Slaves to a child. Now, a slave is going to continually, a slave to sin, is going to continually bump up against where they're weak. They're going to continually bump up against their own brokenness. Whatever it is that's got them enslaved, they're going to continually hit their head up against it. What is it? Money. Attention, prestige, likes, sex, relationships, arrogance, all of them, chains, bump up against them, bump up against them, bump up against them, hit our heads all the time. Their master, their slave, is not a good one. It's a dictatorial one. And sure, you get a little pleasure. You get a little dopamine hit out of bumping up against that, that thing, don't you? Just a little one, right? But where does it lead? It leads for more, right? More broken relationships, a greater identity based on sex, more earnings that I have to sacrifice things I don't want to sacrifice for, more prestige of whatever cost, maybe it's my reputation, ah, giving it a little drop of pleasure, and then a desire for more comes, right? 
What does that sound like to you? It sounds like a drug dealer. Drug dealer, first taste is free, isn't it? Why? Because it gets you hooked. And many of us, man, we're hooked on our, our very dictatorial slave masters and our realities. These things that we think we're free to do are actually driving us towards oblivion. We don't want. Some of us imagine we're just kind of free to obtain freedom as we begin to depart from God's word. Like, man, if I go away from what God says, that's more freedom. It's just a shackle to me. But actually, what we're doing is we, if you are a Christian, you are free, you unshackled yourself from the slave ship, you get off the slave ship, and you go, you know what? I'm free, I'm gonna go back onto the boat, I'm gonna sit right there at the bottom of it, I'm gonna hang here underneath, and I'm gonna continue to be a willing slave to the things I don't wanna be a slave to. Freedom exists out with Jesus, not to do whatever we want. Why? Because the sin nature always wants more, wants to be enslaved. That's what it wants. It wants to be enslaved to something. We are sinners, and when we resist God's word, we actually resist freedom itself. You've seen it. You've tried to quit things you want to quit. You can't quit them. You can't. The slaves in, that Jesus is comparing are to children. Slaves have no power. They are powerless, aren't they? They are powerless. It turns out God's restraints on us and his law are actually the very things that make us free because we're bound by a condition of sin. But the son, he's talking about, right? He says, the slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. The son is in the house of God. Now he's under the rule of God. You're right. He is under the rule of God. You say, you don't like the rule of God? He's under the rule of God. But where is he? He's in the presence of the God. He's in the presence of the Father. He gets access to walk around his home. He gets to open up the fridge. He gets to live freely in his father's house and do whatever he'd like. And he is now filled with power to avoid slavery because he is fully entrusted underneath the banner of a good father. Where the slave has no power, the son, the daughter of God has total power. Access to the one who has all power and can free us from anything. And again, Jesus' words in verse 31, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. What does he mean? If you listen to what I'm saying, you're free. And what the Son sets free is free indeed. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. When you follow God, this is evidence you understand God's truth, the gospel. The gospel is the story of Jesus coming into the world to save people like us from ourselves. Man, I know that's touchy, but actually we are bound by sin, and our sin hurts us. It causes us to do things we don't want to do, remember? Jesus comes, he unshackles us, he makes us free. Come dwell in my house and we'll be together. That's what he's saying. You'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. When you follow God, this is under evidence that you understand the reality of who you are, that you're actually not that free, that actually you need laws to flourish, and that actually God is a better master than the, slave, the, sla uh, the masters that we submit to under sin. So, what does the gospel produce in us? The gospel, the story of us escaping condemnation from the Lord Jesus, from, from giving up the things that, that rule our hearts and, and place them before God's feet so he can remove us. What do, what do we get out of that? Well, we get freedom to rise above sin. Remember the things you want to do that you can't do? You actually get to do those in Jesus. The things that you don't want to do anymore, that, you are, like, that, you, that you're still doing, you get to stop doing those with Jesus. You get to stop. No, I'm serious. You get to stop. Some of, some of us maybe you think that, like, man, your sin is so deep that there's actually legitimately no chance you'll ever be free. Not true. You can be free from whatever it is you think is haunting your spirit. You can be free. You also get freedom to live a holy life. It's not the reverse. You don't do things so God loves you. God loves you, so you do things for him. You miss it. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. You're free to live a holy life. Not bound to live a holy life. You're free to live a holy life. You get a new heart with new desires that love what God loves. You get those things in him. That's where it comes from. If you're here gritting your teeth for Jesus, one, thank you, we need you. If you're here gritting your teeth and your Jesus for life, I got to talk to my coworker, man, I just don't know. Man, I think you're misunderstanding something about yourself. 
There's a gratitude that comes with resting in the Father that you get to play in the Father's house permanently, and as a result, you get to go tell people about that. You're also free to choose right. You've been choosing wrong a long time. You've been choosing wrong a long time. It's, you're actually free to choose right now. Yeah, you, you think, well, well, chemically, I'm an alcoholic. There's no way around that. Chemically, I've been addicted to, to painkillers. Uh, there's just no way around that. In Christ, there is supernatural power that can free you from your bondage. You have access to a good, godly father. The laws of physics are not, God is not bound by the laws of biology and physics. He is not. You're also free to grow. Don't you, don't you want to grow? Don't you want to read more? Don't you want to live? Don't you want to be a kinder person? Be less bitter? Be nicer? Develop a cultivate a less anxious and, and gracious or less anxious presence and a more gracious presence? Don't you want to, don't you want to build that? Haven't you been trying to do that for so long? Do you know you have access to power from Jesus that you haven't tapped into? Do you know that literally dwelling in God's presence and reading his word and meditating in him and praying to him and asking him to be with you can actually free you from things that have been locking you down and make you grow to heights you've never grown before? You don't only need a journal and a planner and a couple videos online and some blogs to grow. Those are all good tools. You can use those. But you can also add supernatural power to it. You also have freedom to reach your potential. Man, I'm telling you what. What is it? 20% of the bookstores? I guess it's Amazon now. No one really goes to the bookstore. But 20% of the bookstores is a self-help. And, you know, you go to the self-help book and it says 10 steps to this and 14 steps to that. And you can grow if you want to and live your best life now. This is how you do it. Go vegan, Right? If you go vegan and you meditate with an app and you, and you start taking walks, then all of a sudden you're, you're going to exponentially grow. Yeah, maybe. But in God, you get to reach your potential. In Jesus, you get to reach your potential, your created potential. Because God's a creator and he created you and so he knows what you're for. And so he actually can shape you and mold you into what he's actually made you for. You might just be guessing in the dark trying to figure out. You might think, too, that like following God's law is actually supposed to limit your potential. Not true. It's going to, you're going to reach your potential. And yeah, maybe you may have to deny some things that you don't, that maybe the world likes. You might have to deny uh, different relationships. You may have to deny earning certain types of money or deny eating certain types of food or being in certain crowds. You may have to deny some of those things, but surely if God made you, his potential for you is the better potential you want to aim at, not your own. By the way, Jesus says, I came, to, I came that you may have life and you may have it in full. He didn't come to give you life in part. He came to give you life in full. Man, I'm telling you, I, it, this is like going to the gas station and then like going in the store and going, listen, I know I heard about gasoline, but I'll take some Jolly Ranchers and pour those in my tank. This should work just fine. You're not going to get your potential. Jesus Christ is the one who made you. He's going to give you the best potential for your life. This is what you need to seek. And then you're also free to know for sure he's with you. Many of us, I mean, I have a lot of doubts. I'm just not sure if Jesus is in my corner. Man, I tell you what, if you're free in Jesus, you're free permanently. Verse 36, so if the sun sets you free, free indeed. Not like maybe, I mean, I don't know, you better keep working. Different religions, they don't know if they're going to get in. They find out in the afterlife. I won't name the names, but many of them are. In, in some religions, there's four levels of heaven. They don't know which level they get until they die. In some religions, they're, they're coming back as another person, and they don't know what person or animal or insect they're coming back as because some sort of karmic God is going to then judge them, and they don't know where they're coming back as. There is assurance in Christianity that other religions don't offer you. What the sun sets free is free indeed. Be free then, not by throwing off all bounds and just living a free life like some sort of Pizza Hut commercial, but you're actually free by embracing the confines of, that you have on you and embrace who God is and he gives you life within your own limitations. And as you find that life, know that God's deepest desire for you is your freedom. 
and your freedom that we all pursue actually leads to bondage. One theologian, he said that true freedom isn't a lack of constraint or choice. It's about becoming who you were meant to be within your choices that you've made and in your construct and in your constraints. The closer we conform to the true image of God and be more like Jesus Christ through obeying his laws, the more freedom we become. Doesn't that sound nice? That's actually possible. Like I, I get it. What is there, 40 people in here? 70 people? I don't know. I can't, I can't even see. There's a bunch of people in here. And we think, man, this is a quiet Sunday morning. I'm just going to come to church. Preacher's going to say a bunch of stuff. I'm going to jet out of here. I'm actually, like, I didn't come up here to, like, I, didn't, I came here to tell people about Jesus. That's actually why we started Bay City. I didn't come to start a church. I came to tell people about Jesus. The truth is, Jesus makes you free. Your sin makes you a slave. Many of us are enslaved to sin right now. It feels good right now. It will not feel good later. Jesus will open you and free you from your bondage. You are more free living in the confines of what he got for you than you do outside of those confines. I'm sure you they lead to death. The farther we drift away from God's law, the more our freedom shrinks. Let's pray.